I love the Honey Ball Sutta. Oh, yeah. Oh, there you go, Jeanette. Now he's going to do it. Oh, <laughs> that's great. So, good afternoon to all, or whatever your time zone is. <laughs> it's afternoon here, so that's what I'm going by. So, we're going to do the Honeyball Sutta. This is the sutta that inspired Jnanananda to write a book called Concept and Reality. And once I ran across that book, I couldn't put it down, and I've read it many times over. It is quite good. Do we still have copies of that? No, the concept and reality. Oh, yes. We still have some copies of that. If you want one sent, I will send it to you. Okay. So, thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country at Cap Vilavatu in Negrotas Park. Cap Vilavatu is where the the uh, the Bodhisattva grew up. He was born in Kapilavatu. Well, he wasn't. He was conceived in Kapilavatu. Um, but he was born on the way to another town. <clears throat> so he was very popular with all the people that uh, lived in the area. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed, taking his bowl and outer robe, went in get into Kapilavatu for alms. When he'd wandered for alms in Kapilavatu and returned from its alms round after taking his meal, he went to the great wood for the day's abiding. Entering the great wood, he sat down at the root of a bulva sapling for the day's abiding. Dandapani. Now, Dandapani was one of the minor rulers of the area. And he was very much into... Um, the Sakyan way of, or not the Sakyan, the uh, oh, I can't think of it right now. The head of the of the uh, four different groups of people. Anyway, he was very much opposed to anything different than what had been being taught before the Buddha came around. While walking and wandering for exercise, he also went to the Great Wood. When he'd entered the great wood, he went to the bulva sapling where the Blessed One was and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, this is something that's actually not practiced in, in the West so much, is a little bit of small talk with each other to find out how their health is and if everything is going along all right. That's one of the reasons why the Westerners have a tendency to think of uh, the Easterners as uh, not relevant in their, 
in their speech because they always ask how, the, how their day is going and that sort of thing. But it is, it is very polite to use that kind of speech. He stood at one side leaning on his stick. Now, because he was a minor ruler of the area, he considered himself higher than the Buddha. And it's a show of disrespect to the Buddha himself that he would keep his head higher than the Buddha's. And he asked, what does the recluse assert? What does he proclaim? Friend, I assert and proclaim such a teaching that one does not quarrel with anyone in the world, with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas. In this generation, with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people. Such a teaching that preconceptions no more underlie that Brahman who abides detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. When this was uh, Dandapani, the Sakyan, without having any other explanation behind it, he heard this and he thought, well, this is absurd. Everybody argues. Everybody has their own opinion. So he shook his head, wagged his tongue, and raised his eyebrows until his forehead was pluckered puckered with three lines. Then he departed leaning on his stick, probably thinking this young whippersnapper doesn't really understand how the world works. When it was evening, the Blessed One rose from his meditation and went to the Negroda, went to Negroda's park where he sat down on a seat made ready and told the monks what had taken place. Then a certain monk asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, what is the teaching that the Blessed One asserts, whereby one does not quarrel with anyone in the world with its gods, its maras, and brahmas, in this generation with its recluses and brahmins, the princes and its people. And venerable sir, how is it that perception no more underlies that brahman who abides detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity? shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. So the Buddha told him what he talked about, and then a monk came back and said, well, just by asking the questions, um, he, he got a, a deeper kind of explanation. Monk, as to the source through which perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation, that means thinking about getting really caught up in your thoughts and your opinions and your ideas of how everything works. How they beset a man if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, the end of the underlying tendency to hatred or aversion. 
the end of the underlying tendency to craving, the end of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malice, and false speech. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. That is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. Then, soon after the Blessed One had gone, the monks considered, now, friends, the Blessed One has risen from his seat and gone into the dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning. So they made a major mistake by not asking questions. Now, who will expound this in detail? Then they considered the venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. He is capable of expounding the detailed meaning. Suppose we went to him and ask him the meaning of this. Then the monks went to the venerable Mahakachana and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down at one side and told him what had taken place, adding, let the venerable Mahakachana expound it to us. The venerable Mahakachana replied, friends, it is though a man seeking heartwood, needing heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, thought that heartwood should be sought for among the branches and leaves of a great tree standing possessed of heartwood. After he had passed over the root and the trunk, so it is with you, venerable sirs, that you think I should be asked about the meaning of this. After you pass the Blessed One by, when you were face to face with the teacher. For knowing the Blessed One knows, I like this part of the passage, it, it really uh, makes me appreciate the Buddha and his words much more after reading this. Seeing, he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma. He is the Holy One. He is the sayer, the proclaimer and elucidator of meaning. The giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. That was the time when you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told you so, you should have remembered it. Surely, Fred Kachana, knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma, he is the Holy One, he is the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata, that was the time when we should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told us, so we should have remembered it. Yet the Venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. 
the venerable Mahakachana is capable of expounding the detailed meaning of this summary given by the Blessed One without expounding the detailed meaning. Kachana, he's in other suttas. And the only thing that he was willing to talk about was different aspects or see ways of seeing the links of dependent origination. He was really sold on that, which is sounds about right. It should be like that. Mahakachana expounds it without finding it troublesome. Then listen, friend, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the monks replied, the venerable Mahakachana said this. Friend, when the Blessed One rose from his seat, and went into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning. That is, monk, as to the source through which perceptions and notions tinge with mental proliferation beset a man. This basically is talking about your own thoughts, your own opinions, your own ideas, but it's all mental verbalization. Continual thinking, 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 and convincing yourself that you're right and somebody else is wrong. <clears throat> if nothing is found there to delight and welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust. The end of the underlying tendency to aversion. The end of the underlying tendency to craving. The end of the underlying tendency to views. The end of the underlying tendency to doubt. Of the underlying tendency to conceit of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to craving and clinging, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, and disputes, recrimination, malice, and false speech. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. I understand the detailed meaning of this to be as follows. Dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises with the meeting of the three. There is eye contact. With eye contact as condition, there is eye feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one is mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notion tinge with mental proliferation beset a man with respect to past, future, and present forms cognizable through the eye. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is ear contact. With ear contact as condition, there is ear feeling. With ear, what one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. 
what one thinks about that one mentally proliferates. And this is your old habitual tendencies and emotional states. So if you learn how to use the six R's correctly, you won't get into that mental proliferation. I just ran across something very interesting. It's the difference between right effort and right striving. What is the difference? Do you know? Right effort is using the six R's. Right striving is when it becomes, the six R's become automatic. You don't have to think about the six R's anymore. They just automatically happen. That only occurs after using the six R's with right effort many, 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 many times. Okay. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises with the meeting of the three. There is ear contact. With ear contact as condition, there is ear feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions tinged with mental proliferation beset a man with respect to the past, future and present smells cognizable through the nose. Dependent on the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is tongue contact. With tongue contact as condition, there is tongue feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notion tends, tend, tinged, by mental proliferation be said a man with respect to the past, future, and present taste cognizable through the tongue. <coughs> Excuse me. Dependent on the body and tangibles, body consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is body contact. With body contact as condition, there is body feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notion tinged by mental proliferation beset a man with respect 
to the past, future, and present tangibles cognizable through the body, dependent on mind and mind objects there is mind consciousness with the meeting of the three is mind contact with mind contact as condition there is mind feeling what one feels that one perceives what one perceives that one craves what one craves that one thinks about what one thinks about that one mentally proliferates with what one has mentally proliferated as a source perceptions and notion tinged by mental proliferation beset a man with respect to the past future and present mind objects cognizable by mind <clears throat> okay. When there is the I a form and I consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of mind or I contact. When there is the manifestation of I contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of I feeling. When there is the manifestation of I feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. Now you see how all of these links are together, but they're not necessarily named in the 12 links of dependent origination in the order that the 12 links are. Consciousness, which is a second link, is the potential for consciousness to arise, but it still needs a condition for it to arise, like eye hitting color and form, then eye consciousness arises. So this is quite a bit different than just straight dependent origination. This works with your everyday life. This works with how the sense doors actually do come into being and their consciousness arises. And what we do with that after it has occurred. So when we were talking about karma, what happened in the past and what you do with what arises in the present, it dictates what's going to happen in the future. If you want your six R's to become automatic, you need to recognize each one of the sense doors and six R them. Because they're all impersonal. They, you don't ask them to come up. These come up by themselves. And what you do with what arises dictates what happens in the future. So if you want your right effort to turn into right striving, that means you have to recognize each one of the sense doors, mostly while you're sitting. It's hard to do with your daily activities, but when you're sitting, you recognize each of these sense doors and six are them because they are a disturbance. They're pulling your attention away from your object of meditation. That's why it's a disturbance. That's why it is a hindrance. When there is the manifestation of perception, 
it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there's a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there's a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notion tinged with mental proliferation. Getting caught up and taking personally whatever sense door there is. And we've been doing it for so many lifetimes. So for so long, we think that this is actually the way things work. But uh, that's why it takes a Buddha to come around and to show us how intricate what we call mind is and what that consciousness actually is. And it's part of an impersonal process. It's not part of a personal process. And every time you use the six R's, you start convincing yourself more and more that everything is impersonal. You're not in control of anything. Everything happens by itself. So it's an interesting uh, perception that you get when you start looking at things in this way, in the way of dependent origination. When there is the ear a sound in ear consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of ear contact. When there is the manifestation of ear contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of ear feeling. When there is the manifestation of ear feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is the manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notion tend by, ten, tinged by mental proliferation. Tinged by is an interesting kind of phenomena because tinged by is actually saying colored by. It colors the way you see the world around you and the way you act around or react as the case may be. When you use the six R's, you start responding with a wholesome mind because you've let go of craving. Every time you use the six R's, you're letting go of craving. And that gets more and more clear as you do it more. And it's one of the things that helps the meditation to be fun. It actually, um, does a wholesome action and you're purifying your mind more and more. As you do that, you start going deeper into your meditation and you start understanding the process of dependent origination more clearly. As you understand it more clearly, then you become successful with your meditation. 
Now, people that are successful with the meditation, I give them a while to get used to it. And then I'll ask them if they want to start teaching. That is the requirement for teaching. Being successful with the practice yourself. Too many times there are people that claim to be teachers that don't truly understand how, what the Buddha is talking about, but they like the idea and the pride-filled idea of I'm a teacher, I'm something special and you have to respect me. The thing is, you gain respect as you teach the Buddha's teaching from the suttas. A lot of people have a lot of respect for me because of my habit of reading from the suttas themselves. So you know that it's not coming from me, it's not my words. And I don't claim them to be my words. They happen all on their own. And the respect gained by that, the understanding that people have is amazing. Now, when I first started out, I was teaching straight Vipassana because that's what I knew. And there was always some disrespect that was going around. Oh, you don't know what you're saying. You make a mistake here and there. But as I started reading the suttas, and this I am forever beholding to Venerable Punaji who guided me to start reading the suttas. I would give a retreat and all of a sudden everybody would be benefiting from the Dhamma talks in a way that their meditation went deeper, faster than I'd ever expected. I couldn't believe how fast people were understanding. And that's just from going to, well, I'm going to freelance my talks to going to, I'm going to read you what the Buddha said. Now, if I was a, if I was a very young monk, I actually would spend my time memorizing each one of those suttas so that I could recite them at any time. But because I was an old man when I became a monk, uh, I have to read them. So if you're successful with your meditation, if you follow the directions like they're given in the suttas and the directions that I give in a retreat, uh, you will be successful. Now, a lot of people have this idea they want to be a teacher, but they just want the prestige of being a teacher. And that's not it. That's uh, prestige. Who cares? People say, Oh, but Bhante, you're so popular. So many people know you. I don't care. I honestly don't care. Because it's not my teaching. I can't take credit for it. It's the Buddha's teaching. And that honor and respect should go to the Buddha. So... Let's see, we did. 
when there is the nose and odors and nose consciousness arises, it is possible to point out the manifestation of nose contact. When there is a manifestation of nose contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of nose feeling. When there is a manifestation of nose feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is a manifestation of craving, it's possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. So, right now, we're talking about your observations while you're in the lower jhanas, the first jhana to the fourth jhana. Then you get to the mental realm. There is no manifestation of the eyes or ears unless there is contact. In other words, you don't see anything if your eyes are closed. If there is contact with the nose or the tongue or the body in any way or the ear, if there is contact, there is a manifestation of this consciousness. If there is no contact and you are in a mental realm where there is no more body, then you are watching more and more closely the subtle nature of everything. You're starting to see more and more clearly how all of this actually does work. And you start believing that this is the way it works and it's not made up. It's the way it actually is. And this is how your faith becomes strong from your direct personal experience. Now, it's real interesting because I tell people over and over again, you are your own teacher. You have to have the direct experience to see how this kind of stuff works before you're going to be able to teach it to anyone else. When you see things as they actually are, you wind up having so much confidence that it's amazing. And that confidence pulls over into the way that you do the reading or the explaining of the suttas. So if people are really ready to try and follow the way you're talking, then it is pretty amazing to be able to see the progress that your students will make. And it all comes back from listening to the suttas, practicing the way the Buddha said to practice, and the way the teacher says to practice because of the direct experience that they have. That is how you get to be a teacher. And you teach by example more then you're talking and trying to convince somebody of something. When there is the manifestation of craving, then it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notion tinged 
by mental proliferation, colored by your mental proliferation. And what you want to be doing is going to a state where you have stronger and stronger balance of mind, where you have stronger and stronger equanimity. <coughs> David. I just ran out of water. When there is the tongue and flavors and tongue consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of tongue contact. When there's a manifestation of tongue contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of tongue feeling. When there's a manifestation of tongue feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there's a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there's a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions tinged with mental proliferation. When there is the body intangibles and body consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of body contact. When there is a manifestation of body contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of body feeling. When there is a manifestation of body feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there's a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by per perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation. When there is mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. It is possible to point out not the manifestation of mind contact. When there's manifestation of mind contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of mind feeling. When there is a manifestation of mind feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there's a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notion tinged by mental proliferation. Now, we're getting into the mental realm. And it says, when there is no I, no forms, no I consciousness, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of I contact. If that consciousness can't arise, because you're in a mental state and you're staying with the quiet mind, this is a whole different ball game. Now, when you're in this state, it's important for you to understand that um, your mind is very pure at that time. There is no craving. There is no disturbance pulling you away. There is no hindrance. 
your mind is just quiet. This is where you purify your mind the most. When you get into neither perception nor non-perception, it's they're leading to Nibbana, the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, and Nibbana itself, which is an undescribable. So, when there is no manifestation of eye, of eye contact, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of eye feeling. Of course, all of those things follow. It's impossible to point these things out because they don't arise. And if they do arise, then there's something that is pulling your attention to it. Now, quite often, uh, especially in Malaysia and Indonesia, I have a lot of students that can get to neither perception or non-perception, but they get caught up in their thinking. And they keep making a big deal out of that, not realizing that they are causing themselves suffering. So, I've cut the six R's down to saying, if you see this kind of thing arising and pulling your attention away, relax. Allow it to be there by itself. Don't follow it. The second step of right effort is letting the distraction be there by itself without putting your attention on it at all. And when you do that, then you, it's easy to relax that tension and tightness caused by that distraction. So you relax and come back to the quiet mind, come back to your object of meditation, stay with your object of meditation as long as you can. Which when you get to this state, can be quite long. It can be 20 minutes, 30 minutes, even an hour. I have one student that he had a five hour sit and I asked him how many times his mind wandered away. And he said, no, it, it was just five hours of staying with his quiet mind. So it is possible to do that. Um, it is rare that somebody can do it for that long, I have to say, but he worked at it. He worked at it for quite a few years before he was able to do that. But I tell you just as a goal that you can try for yourself eventually. But sitting with that quiet mind is very, very important and necessary. when there's no manifestation of, <clears throat> I forgot what the sense door was on. Was it eye or ear? I think it was eye. Okay, okay. Eye feeling. It is impossible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there's no manifestation of perception, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of craving. See, if there is no disturbance at all, then it's not going to come up. It's not going to cause you any kind of problem. Okay? And this is important to realize.
you don't want to use the six R's as some kind of a stick to beat away your uh, disturbance. That's not what it's about. The whole reason for the six R's is to let go of craving. Craving is the source of all suffering. So the more you use the six R's and let go of the disturbance without keeping your attention on it, the purer your mind becomes, the more balanced your mind becomes, the quieter your mind becomes. So it's an interesting process and it does turn out to be quite fun as you learn how to do it yourself. When there's no manifestation of craving, then it is impossible to point out the manifestation of thinking. If craving doesn't arise, thinking won't arise. If thinking won't arise, mental proliferation won't arise. If mental proliferation doesn't arise, the birth of action doesn't arise. If the birth of action doesn't arise, guess what? Aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair will not arise. And when it happens like that, guess what? You have experienced Nibbana. There's an awful lot of people that are um, doubtful about being able to attain Nibbana in this time. But most of that occurs because of what they heard from their teacher. And their teacher hasn't been practicing quite the same way in, in the suttas as is necessary for you to experience this. So they have doubts on their own and in the West, it's brought to the attention of a lot of people that you're not supposed to talk about your spiritual experiences with anybody but a teacher. And they get that idea because in the rules of Vinaya, monks don't talk about that sort of thing with uh, with laymen because they won't understand. If I know somebody is an anagami or I know that they are very advanced and I have questions for them, then we discuss that kind of thing. But I would never do that with laymen. And a lot of people, they, they have all kinds of claims for me. I must be an arahat because I've been a monk for so long. Well, I'll tell you, I spent 12 years in Asia looking for an arahat and I never found one. And I certainly am not one. So it's a personal experience for me. What difference does it make if I'm a Sotapan or a Saktagami or Anagami? What difference does that make to you? Is that going to help your practice get better? Well, I have not found that to be the case ever, but a lot of the teaching that I give is by example. Oh, 
Okay. When there is no nose, no odors, no nose consciousness, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of nose contact. Makes sense, doesn't it? When there is no manifestation of nose contact, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of nose feeling. Well, all of this makes perfect sense because this is the way it works. If there is no disturbance at the, the nose door, then how can there be a consciousness? There's not going to be any smell because there's nothing causing it. And that is getting into the mental realms. When there's no manifestation of nose feeling, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of perception. There's nothing to perceive. If there's no contact, there is not going to be any perception at all. Because there no feeling arises. When there's no manifestation of perception, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of craving. So if there's no perception of anything, why would craving arise? Just to be annoying? Just to be... It needs to have a condition before it will occur. Okay? When there's no manifestation of craving, there's no manifestation of thinking. It is impossible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notion tinged by mental proliferation. And this goes through all of the sense doors. Now, when the Blessed One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling after giving a summary and brief without expounding a detailed meaning, that is, monks, as to the source through which perceptions and notion tinged by mental proliferation, said a man, if nothing is found there to delight in it, welcome it and hold to it, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, of the underlying tendency to aversion, of the underlying tendency to craving, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance, this is the end of resorting to rods and weapons of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, and malice, and false speech. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. I understand the detailed meaning of this summary to be thus. Now, friends, if you wish, go to the Blessed One, ask him about the meaning of this, as the Blessed One explains it to you, so you should remember it. Then the monks, having delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Mahakachana's words, rose from their seats and went to the Blessed One, after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told the Blessed One all that had taken place after he left. Adding, then Venerable Sir, we went to the Venerable Mahakachana and he expounded the meaning to us with these term statements and phrases. Mahakachana is wise, monks. Mahakachana has great wisdom. If you'd ask me the meaning of this, I would have explained it to you in the same way. 
that Mahakachana has explained it. Such is the meaning of this, and so you should remember it. Now, when this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, just as if a man exhausted by hunger and weakness came upon a honey ball, in the course of eating it, he would find a sweet, delectable flavor. So too, venerable sir, any able-bodied person in the course of scrutinizing with wisdom the meaning of this discourse on the Dhamma would find satisfaction and confidence of mind. Venerable sir, what's the name of the discourse on the Dhamma? As to that, Ananda, you may remember this discourse on the Dhamma as the honey ball discourse because it is so sweet. That is what the Blessed One said. Ananda, Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So I really like this sutta because it spells out exactly what to expect with your meditation and how to really see the impersonal nature of everything. That's good. I very much appreciate it. So do you have any questions? Dante, yes. can you hear me? Good afternoon. Thank you for your talk. Yes. Um, I'm just struggling at some of the concepts to make sure I understand them and where the sutta reads what one feels one perceives. For me, perception, I have interpreted that as a mind object. It's, it's mm. our mind, a thought about what an object is. So is that incorrect and if so what actually is perception? perception is a part of the mind that names the feeling okay perception and feeling are always conjoined they're always together uh, so a, a happy feeling arises automatically your mind says oh that's happy but that's I, not a thought uh-huh that's our mind thinking that we're happy. That isn't a thought. It is as a, a, as a thought object. It is a thought that comes up. It is a kind of thought. It's an observation thought. Okay. It seems to me that then we're having a, so, when a thought comes up, we have a, mi a no, mind contact. Has... Sorry. Well, when that mind contact occurs, perception arises right after that. They are conjoined. They are always not disjoined. But per and, feeling comes up after the contact. So I'm just trying to get clear where the perception arises. You just said it arises right with after consciousness. feeling. Okay. It is the part of the mind that names it pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. This is where our conceptual thinking begins with perception. But it, and it is a mind object, perception. It is a mind object. I don't quite know what you're talking about here. You're trying to make it as something separate. And it's not. It okay. is conjoined with feeling. It is the part of the mind that names that feeling as pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. Okay, now let's, the next question then is on the same thing. When we have craving, what one craves, one thinks about is thinking about, right. 
it is that the same as clinging or is that another step yes. i'm just putting this in yes, the order it is of clinging it is and, clinging great and okay. the the mental proliferation is bhava is right Thank behind you. clinging and that's where all of your emotional ideas and thoughts and wants to control your feeling with your thoughts. In other words, that's where you really are taking on heavily the identification of this is my feeling, this is me. Thank you. Okay. Hello, Bhante. Hello. Uh, the extension to the same question. Uh, can we replace clinging with thinking always? Yeah. But the clinging is, is, is more than just that. It's more than just thinking. It's where it really becomes cemented in of taking something personally. That's where it gets really strong. It starts with craving, I am, but it gets stronger when you have thoughts, opinions, ideas, concepts, things like that, and you take them personally. Then you get into your emotional love, um, trying to come up with excuses why this or that worked and didn't work. But it's all part of the ego game of I am that. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Anything okay. else? Uh, I had the same, uh, my question been asked by him. I have no, I have no more questions now. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Bhante. Hey. Uh, hey, I have a question. I have a oh, question. good. Okay. I have a question about contact. And the way I understand it, it's like you have say an ear and then there's a sound and i guess they they and then there's a, a consciousness and it's like they all touch in that moment when they right. first touch that's contact right. is that right that is contact okay all right that's what i'm thinking about okay i'm just trying to put it together yeah, there are some people that have this weird belief that they are in control of the contact and the feeling and that they can go beyond that. But this is all part of the physical process that we go through. We go from the physical into the mental. But then you have the Dhammapada verse that says mind is a forerunner of all states. That doesn't necessarily mean thinking. That means observing. It is the start of conditioned things. Okay. That's interesting. I don't totally understand everything you said, but. And you have to listen to it a few times for it to really work. Okay. But I, I highly recommend getting a copy of uh, Concept and Reality. Jnana, not, Venerable Nanda was brilliant in the way that he understood, uh, well, concepts and reality. 
And what we call concepts are our opinions, thoughts, and ideas, hopes, and wishes for things to be in a particular way. But the reality is, this is the way that it works. Mm. And as you see that more and more clearly in your own practice, as you start realizing it's not just 6R and carry on, but it's deeply understanding the process. As you get more and more clear in that, the easier it is to not get involved in the content of your thinking but allow it to be there by itself with a relaxed, craving, free mind. Um, okay? Yes, that sounds nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you got to teach yourself this way. That's the thing. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So keep your practice going daily and have fun. Appreciate the understanding that you get and play with that. The more fun you can have with your practice, the easier it is to be successful. And I truly understand that because I had 20 years of not having fun with the practice. So it's, it's quite a bit easier now. Well, I like having fun, so I'll try. All right. <laughs> You'll find your mindfulness gets really a lot sharper as you have fun with everything. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Hi, Bunty. Uh, Hello. Uh, it's been a few weeks since uh, since I was here last, so I, I hope you've been well. I hope everything's going well. Um, yeah. I have a few uh, questions. Um, so uh, I guess the most important question is, uh, in the last few weeks, I've uh, felt that my practice is not, not, has not been going so well. And I still have good meditations. I just some sometimes feel the urge to just leave after a certain amount of time. I'm not able to sit for as long as I used to. Um, I, I know that I'm supposed to use the six hours, yeah. but uh, it just feels like I'm fighting with it at some point. And I just wonder if you have any advice about, uh, about that. Well, when you first start out, that's the hardest part of the meditation. It gets easier as you uh, start teaching yourself how to use the six R's properly because that's the way you do it. Don't say each one of the six R's. Do what the six R says. Okay, so you, you'll, you'll recognize that your mind is distracted. If you have a lot of distractions, ask your intuition to find out what is the cause of all of this mental, mental proliferation. What's the ca cause of all of these distractions? Your intuition will guide you and show you where you're making a mistake and how to overcome it. Okay. But you have to develop one thing. And it's one of the harder things to develop. 
and that is patience. If your mind tells you, oh, I want to get up, just let it be. No, I'll sit here for another 10 minutes. Okay? And it will get easier as you teach your mind. But right now, your mind is like a mad monkey. It's jumping all over the place. Yep. And don't fight it. Don't tell yourself you shouldn't be like that because that's the way you are. That's the truth. So laugh with it and have fun with it. Don't criticize yourself and be hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. The more you smile, the more you laugh, the more you have fun with life, the easier your sitting meditation will become. Right. So I, I want you to smile more. You're being too serious. You're trying to accomplish something. There's nothing to accomplish but having a happy mind. So smile into that and laugh with yourself when you get serious. Okay? Okay. I, I guess that's the that's the one thing that I haven't been able to uh, to implement in my own life. Uh, well, because we don't teach ourselves that way for the first however many years you've been alive. Yeah. You've, you've taught to be serious. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, let's start a new habit. Let's smile. Let's have fun. Okay? okay. Uh, Bhante, just a couple more questions. I'll try to be as brief as I can. Okay. Uh, so, um, when when one practices metta and karuna in, in the way that you and uh, and I was reminded, as you said, of of the late uh, great venerable uh, Punaji, who is also a, a hero of mine. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, aren't uh, so when you practice metta and karuna, aren't those cravings as well? They're just not for oneself. No. They're no, that you're purifying your mind. So the, Which the, wholesome thing. There's no craving in wholesome. I see. Uh, but uh, the idea that I want all beings to be happy, isn't that a, a desire? Isn't that I a don't craving? don't want them to be happy, just wish them happiness. Okay. There's no I in there. Mm -hmm. There's just a, a, a wishing for all beings to be free and happy and uplifted. Mm. It's just a wish. It's not a craving kind of wish. It's just you're not demanding that all beings be happy. You're wishing that. Mm -hmm. And that helps your mind to be uplifted. Uh, would you agree with the translation of the word mudita as uh, appreciative joy, or do you have a different? I don't answer? really like those kind of definitions because they go outside of mind. Well, I appreciate uh, the success that my father had, or or some other relative, or some other person, but I call it simply joy. Because oh. it is a mental state. Right. And I really don't like those definitions. Sympathetic joy. Sympathy? Because somebody's experiencing joy? No. No, 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 no. Altruistic, well, you're still looking at someone outside of yourself. And this practice is about going deeper into yourself. 
to see where your old habits of identifying with this and that happen. Do you see what I'm saying? Partially, I, th I think. Okay, I think I need more uh, more experience to completely understand. Well, you just practice loving kindness by itself. You will develop the ability to go into compassion, into joy, into equanimity, and beyond. Mm -hmm. But you have to have patience. And you have to have a sense of fun about yourself rather than criticize yourself. Okay? Uh, just one final question, Bhante, and then I'll, uh, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> Um, so I started reading the Angotara Nikaya today, uh, and I honestly, I've seen a, a couple of things here that kind of bother me a little bit. So, uh, I'm going to ask you about them. Okay. Uh, so as long as I stayed in the Machima Nikaya, I was fine. But, uh, so here, uh, for example, one thing that it says in the book of the ones is, um, I'm quoting, it's impossible and inconceivable that a woman could be an arahant who is a perfectly enlightened Buddha, uh, wheel-turning monarch, uh, position of Saka, Mara, position of Brahma, etc. Mm -hmm. There's no possibility. Right. But it's possible that a man could occupy the position of Brahma. There right. is such a possibility. This bothers me because... Wow. because uh, to be equal between men and women, they're not. Women have their own function and they are different from men. Let's say you go out into the forest and you want to sit in meditation. If a woman goes out into the forest, quite often they get attacked by beasts because their odor is different than men's. They are different. They have different functions. So, I know this uh, women's equality and all of this kind of stuff is really important, but it doesn't happen in a real world in exactly the same way as they would like it to happen. Uh, and also, you have to understand that the Brahmins, right after the Buddha died, about 250 years after the Buddha died, the Brahmins started taking over the robes for monks. And they started changing a lot of the suttas. They started changing them. One of the suttas says that a woman can never become a leader of a, a country. And whoops, how many women leaders of country are there? That is just the Brahmin prejudice. Now, the further the text went away from the actual Buddha's teaching, the more uh, confusion and wrong thinking there is that's being added into it. And it hasn't been cleared out all the way, even though there has been Buddhist councils that have tried to clear out the mistakes. There's still mistakes that are made. But women have a different kind of body. They have a different kind of outlook than men. And that's the truth, whether you like it or not. Oh, women can be arahats. They just cannot be Buddhas. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I 
particularly point out that women can be arahats mm -hmm. in, in some of the suttas that I give because they, they were brilliant in a lot of ways. But they're different. Uh, and would you agree that uh, the difference between an arahant and, and a buddha is not limited only to the fact that they delayed um, entering uh, nibbana, but also that a buddha has knowledge beyond simply that knowledge of the Knowledge beyond. The way that uh, it's been described to me is that you have a bottle of whiskey and you pour the whiskey out. You still have the smell of whiskey, but, and that would be like the, the arahats after the Buddha. But the one that the Buddha had, it's been scoured out so that there's absolutely no, no smell, no imperfection in that bottle. And, and also uh, perhaps knowledge of other things such as the knowledge of previous eon, uh, eons and so on. Uh, oh, but yeah. there's a... Well, I, I have friends that uh, they can uh, see an eon in their own practice. They developed uh, doing past lives and now, now they see past and, and future in some ways. But future is really difficult because it's always changing and depending on conditions. Right. But she could remember, I, I, I've run across people and they, they do past life regression. And I can remember 182 different past lifetimes. Fine, but that's not very many. Uh, how many times have we be, been actually reborn? So uh, you can, you're reborn. Uh, somebody gave me a number, I don't know where the number number came from, whether it's really true or not. But one eon is equivalent to one million lifetimes. That's a lot, a lot of lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And to be able to recall that at will, the different lifetimes is, is a remarkable ability. But a lot of people, when they get into past lifetimes, oh, I want to remember all these past lifetimes. They get kind of bored with it after a while because it's all more of the same. It, it's, uh, there's, there's no surprises. We've all done really bad things and we've all done really good things. And we keep coming around because we have identified with the bad things and the good things and taken them personally and that's what karma is all about. But with this practice you start developing more and more wholesome nature in your mind. You stop taking things so personally and you start following the precepts without breaking them and things like that. The more you do that, the more pure your mind becomes and that's what allows you to get off of the wheel of sansara the wheel of birth and death. Okay. Thank you very much, Bhante. Okay. Anybody else? If I may have a question, Bhante. Okay. Uh, there are days that uh, <clears throat> I have quite strong uh, memories from my early childhood. And uh -huh. 
my grandparents are very vivid there. Uh, of course, they passed away more than 50, almost 50 years ago. But somehow, you know, especially when I practice, when I do more practice or when I read suttas, then these memories, uh, somehow they, they come. It's, I mean, it's nothing disturbing me or not negative, but somehow I wonder, should I send loving kindness to them or of should course. I use it as distraction and stay with my spiritual friends? What would you advise? No, you, you can, uh, if, if they're happening, let, let me explain something to you. There are people that are more sensitive to feeling than they are intellectual pursuits. So you're sensitive to feeling, you'll have a tendency to have memories from past existences. The thing that you want to do is develop your equanimity so good actions and bad actions don't knock you off, off base. You can always put forgiveness into anything and you can put loving kindness into anything so you can radiate loving kindness but when you're doing a meditation practice at the time that you're sitting only do that practice mm -hmm. don't jump off and and say, oh, I'm going to send loving kindness to my grandfather now. Okay. <laughs> you can do that during the day. Anytime mm -hmm. the, something like that comes up, you can remember and do that then. And sometimes when this kind of thing would happen to me, what I would wind up doing was I, uh, while I was sitting, I would put a little red flag on that, that memory and tell myself, well, when I get out, uh, when I get out of the sitting, then I'm going to have that memory come back up and then I can do whatever I feel is correct at that time. Did that help? That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bante. <laughs> okay. Anyone else with a question? Okay, then let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck, fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I hope you all have a happy, fun week coming up and you can smile and wish other people well. Goodbye for now. Thank you, Bante. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bante. Very, very welcome. Thank you, Bante. Thank you very much.